Hello, everybody. I'm I'm Karen Michael, and I'm president of the North American Butterfly Association um, here in Central Kentucky. And um, I'm so thankful that you guys have asked me to speak tonight. Thank you to uh, Barbara, who's my out of area member, which is awesome. Um, and that is because we set it up in a certain area in Central Kentucky with I'm in Lexington and the zip codes are around us, which we'll kind of talk about in a minute. And so that other people could start chapters within the state. So that's why we're called NABA Central Kentucky. That's awesome. Before, so like I said, we're NABA Central Kentucky and we're gonna talk about butterflies and more. So we're gonna kind of start out with just about what NABA is and then the fun part towards the end about the Texas Butterfly Festival that I attended last week um, and give you a little bit of fun stuff from that as well. So um, just to let you know, um, what NABA is. We're the North American Butterfly Association. Um, they were formed in 1992, um, but we are a, a membership-based 501c3 nonprofit. My chapter was formed in 2019, so I am very new at this, and I met, I spoke online with a girl who was starting a chapter in Tampa. Her name is Anita Camacho, and she was also just starting a chapter and she's an accountant. So she kind of walked me through the whole process of setting up a nonprofit. And she started Tampa. I started here in central Kentucky and we're part of just a, a larger group of people who love, who love butterflies. And this is a listing of our chapters. She became that sixth chapter in Florida. Um, they are the biggest they have the most chapters um, and, and the reason they do is because a couple of them, I could be wrong, one or two, I tried to look it up before we got on here, um, is set up specifically for um, the preservation of a specific butterfly in Florida. And that's kind of how they got started and then it branched off from there. Um, I, I don't know if everyone is active in this group, um, but I do know that uh, New Jersey is the home to our president. Dr. Dr. Jeffrey Glassberg, who is the president and founder of NABA. And I know that the New Jersey chapter is very, um, is very active. Um, I hope that I'll know how active they are next year because at the Texas Butterfly Festival, we will be having our biennial NABA members meeting. They do it every two years. Um, they, since they didn't do it this year, that's why I went to the festival because I just didn't want to miss it. Um, obviously, it didn't happen last year because of COVID. So um, it will be a chance for anybody who is a NABA member or a NABA president to come together and there'll be an actual business meeting. So what do you get with your membership when you join? Well, you're helping to conserve butterflies, uh, for one. It is a charitable uh, donation. But you're also going to get two beautiful publications, American Butterflies and Butterfly Gardener. They are done, these publications are done just by volunteers. So even with that said, they are striking. When you're gonna get those in the mail and you're gonna look at them and just think, man, you know, what am I missing around the country? Because you could, you could yourself put an article in. And uh, Barbara, I think you should get some pictures in one of these magazines so we can, we can see them. Um, and they're looking for editors and they're looking for different stories from the area. So I'll probably submit something for one of them, probably not the butterfly gardener. I'm talking to a bunch of gardeners and flowers are my weakness. So I, I rely on you all to teach me all the things there is to know about the flowers and the plants because I started with the insects first and now I'm learning about all the plants. But so American Butterflies is probably more geared towards where I would put my story. Um, but anyway, these are beautiful publications publications and you get them as part of your membership. And I just wanted to share that with you guys. Here's your membership levels. These are kind of new. And NABA just allowed us to be able to do everything online instead of filling out forms the old fashioned way. I like people who are joining my, my chapter, even if you're from out of area, um, to still use the written form and write on there, I'm joining NABA Central Kentucky as an out of area member. That way I'm still gonna get your information, your email address, and I can add you to the email list, which tonight at the end, if you wanna be added to that, we can, we can get a list started. And that way you can keep up with everything that we're doing in our area. And I hope to come down to your area as well um, and do some things down there uh, in the spring and the summer. 
the institutional members, I'm trying to think, I have Columbia Gas uh, was an institutional member. I believe they still are. I should get an updated member listing in December. Um, Flora Cliff, but it, really it's Beverly James who's the preserve director. She is, she is a member. Um, Wilson's uh, Garden in Frankfurt, they are an institutional member. That is the butterfly greenhouse where you go and see the butterflies. Although NABA's stance is you, butterflies should never be captured ever and put in a home and in, in a little in a little greenhouse. Um, they're working with an area, they're working with another group um, that is doing the preservation of butterflies as well. And so that's where they they get their butterflies from. But they also um, let them roam free around their around their beautiful garden center. So I think if you got a chance to go out to Wilson's and they got a great little cafe, it's called Sage Cafe. Uh, go out there and check check out the butterfly greenhouse. So what do we do? What does NABA do? Well, the one thing NABA does all chapters around the country is an annual butterfly count. And Beverly James of Floorcliff, who I've mentioned before, started this butterfly count before I even created my chapter. And she submits her numbers to NABA every year as part of being a, a good citizen scientist. So she is the one, if you look at the map there, and I have a little pointer I was going to use. Um, this map here shows the perimeter in Lexington that she outlined for our butterfly count every year. So if other counts wanted to be created, they could. You just have to do that and submit it on the NABA website. Um, but she's been a big help about doing it. And this year, this last year was our fifth year. So we even did it during COVID. We just did it in very, very small groups of only four people at different locations. I usually count at Raven Run Nature Sanctuary in Lexington, or I count at uh, Waveland, which is really just down the road from me, a beautiful historic museum. I count at um, Wellington Gardens. Others will count at the Arboretum. Um, Flora Cliff, obviously. And then there's a couple of other parks within Parks and Rec. Heisel Farm Park is one. And we go to all these areas. This last year, it rained on us. Crazy. We were at Raven Run and I knew it was going to storm. I was carrying my phone around because I have like six weather apps and I could see that the sky's coming. So we just went into the forested area and hid under some trees, which you shouldn't do in lightning. <laughs> Let me just tell you that. Don't do that in lightning. But we hid there until the rain passed. And I'm going to tell you that I have now discovered that after a storm passes in the summer and the sun comes out, that is the best time to find the butterflies. We had the biggest numbers we've had in the longest time. It was like a miracle because they all come out uh, to dry off, uh, to get food. So NAPA counts are very fun. It's usually the second Saturday in July. I forgot to put that on there. It's usually the second Saturday in July. Um, it's supposed to be around July 4th, but with all the activities going on in different cities, it's hard to do it July 4th. So we just trying to do it somewhere around that date um, in our area. But as you can see here, we had 38 counters in, in 2021 this year. We saw 2,046 individual butterflies and 43 different species um, between all of the areas that we saw. Um, one additional in caterpillar stage, which I found, which was a monarch caterpillar at Raven Run. So we really had an excellent year um, for, our, for our butterfly count. The other thing, and I was gonna put this in the chat, but I don't think I can, because yeah, my chat's not showing up, but I'll just read it to you, um, is, let me just get this out of the way so I can see it. Hang on with me just one second. Okay, there it is. So NABA has the certified butterfly garden um, and the certified monarch garden signs that you can get. So if you go to nababutterfly.com, there's no www in front of that. It's just nababutterfly.com. Um, you will see their program for certifying your garden. And you can get these beautiful signs to go there. You already may be a Monarch Way Station, and that's awesome if you're if you're registered with Monarch Watch as a Monarch Way Station. But you can also be certified with North American Butterfly Association and get these beautiful signs. 
there's a whole lot of other activities there on that website as well too. So when you get a chance, just go look at it. And if we have time, I'll pull it up. Another thing that's really important about the North American Butterfly Association is being a good citizen scientist, but you're gonna to want to report your sightings to NABA. As you can see, that's a screenshot of when I, I uh, reported my sightings and that was at Floor Cliff um, in March. And we saw a white M hair streak. And that um, is kind of a shock because they, you don't see them very often at all. Uh, this was early in the year. Uh, we were there for another event. It wasn't for butterflies, but a white M hair streak showed up on the spice bush before it was fully, this is just the flowers of the spice bush in early spring. So I went into my NABA sightings and I'll give you this uh, website when we're done, but it's sightings, there's no www, sightings, S-I-G-H-T-I-N-G-S dot NABA dot org. Log, create yourself a login and password. And then you just go in and type all the information. And you can see I, I spotted one white M hair streak on an early blooming spice bush at Flora Cliff. I kind of like to put, you know, it's not, common to our area. Usually I put the weather in. I'm surprised I didn't do that. It's helpful to say it was a beautiful sunny day. The temperature was 60 degrees. There was a light breeze. Um, the serious scientists like to know all that. So you guys can do that. And that's a very important NABA activity that I want you to know about. It's very similar to iNaturalist. If you use iNaturalist at all, you can use that on your phone or online. So it's, it's basically the same thing, except you're not asking people to identify for you. You've already identified it and you're uploading it. Another activity that NABA does is they go, uh, they alternate year to year between art and photo contests. So this year was an art contest um, and next year will be the photography contest. So the winner receives $300 and the first runner up receives 100 and the winning entries are published in the American Butterflies publication that you get with your membership. Um, they have to be a, a free flying unrestrained butterflies taken in the field, not in a butterfly zoo in Canada, the United States or Mexico. So I'll be sharing more information about that on our Facebook page as well, which it just So the National Butterfly Center. The National Butterfly Center is a project of the North American Butterfly Association um, that you can see here. It is owned and operated by NABA. Uh, Mariana Trevino Wright is the director and I did get to meet her last week and I now have made a new best friend. Um, she is an amazing, an amazing woman and she protects this land and the site like it is her own child. Um, so that right there is one reason to go to this festival or to go at any point that you have time to the National Butterfly Center, sit down with her, talk with her about what her mission is and the mission of the center is and how important what they're doing is. It's, it's just simply amazing. So um, as you can see here on the graphic, it's a 100 acre wildlife center, native species, botanical garden. There are trails for exploring. Um, I got on several trails that were even that were even ravines and ditches when it rains, which isn't real often. Um, and that's where we found some of the most unusual butterflies, um, the ones you don't see uh, out on flowers all the time, the ones that sometimes hide in trees and hide in leaves and things like that. So they have a beautiful trail there in that bottom right picture um, is the butterfly conservatory it's an outdoor classroom so it looks like you would think that it, the walls are all open so everything's open in there and that's also where they do their uh, native plant sales as well which i know you guys are also doing native plant sales um, where is can, that i'm sorry where is it that's in the back side of the center no, where is the center? Oh, it's in Mission, Texas. I'm getting there. It's coming up on a couple of slides. Thank you. <laughs> Good question, though. It is in Mission, Texas. So here you go. We're going to talk about the Texas Butterfly Festival. This is next year's dates, and my next slide shows you where it is. Um, next year is October 29th through November 1st. It, it runs from a uh, Saturday to a Tuesday, but that first day is usually Community Day, um, where they... Uh, 
the center's open for everybody all the time, but on that particular day, they have a lot of events for children. They have a native plant sale, um, different activities along stations around the whole place. And then we have our first meeting and orientation of the people who have registered for the event that evening on the 29th. And then every day after that, uh, the next three days, you're split up into groups and you go to se several locations throughout Texas. So let me show you where I'm talking about. See that little dot all the way down there on the Texas-Mexican border, Texas-Mexico border? That's where Mission is. So you fly into McAllen, Texas. There's another airport there called Hall Halogen, I think. Um, but I, I flew into McAllen and it's a small airport. It's smaller than uh, Lexington's airport. It only has two little baggage claims and they're really small. Um, but I just went Lexington to Dallas, Dallas to Mission. And um, it's a small town. It's, it's like I said, it's near, it's near the border of Mexico. The back side of the Butterfly Center does um, border the Rio Grande. Um, it's, it's absolutely stunning. So, um, and then I didn't realize when I was there how, maybe some of you have been to this area before, but I didn't realize how small the Rio Grande River is. Um, especially at the, at the spot behind the Butterfly Center, um, which is just right down here. I don't know if you can see my mouse. Let me get my pointer right down here along this edge. Cause there, this is Mission and the Butterfly Center is about right here where that spot is. I just put my little pointer. Uh, it literally took me 15 minutes from my hotel every day to get out there. Um, but now comes the good stuff. What questions do you have for me before I start showing you different butterflies that we saw in Texas that we do not have here in this area in central Kentucky? What questions do you have for me so far? Um, uh, so did you see any monarchs or have they all migrated through? I did see monarchs. I saw lots of monarchs. They have not, they had not all migrated through. And something else that's cool to know that I learned when I was there is some of those monarchs just stay there. They don't all go to Mexico. And everything we've been taught about how some monarchs turn off their ability to mate and become this super generation, that last generation, that fourth, um, they don't do that in Texas. They, I found a couple of caterpillars on milkweed while I was there. I watched a monarch lay an egg. Um, so that was just blew my mind because we know that up here, they don't do that, but it's different down there. It's, it's warm year round. Um, so what Mariana taught me was that um, the di whole diapause situation with monarchs doesn't apply to them. So I did see a lot of monarchs, but I saw a great deal more of something else I'm getting ready to show you. So great question, because it's a good segue into this. This is the queen butterfly. Its cousin is the soldier, which I don't, I couldn't find a picture of on my, uh, on my camera. Um, the queen is a mimic of the, mo of the monarch butterfly. It is smaller. And I have never seen so many queens in my life as I saw in Mission, Texas, and in all the areas that we went to. Um, I, I looked on a, on a map today to see if they make it up to our area and they have made it to very Southern Kentucky before, but it's not been recorded in a really long time. So that's not to say that they won't again. It's just been a really long time. So um, the picture on the left um, is just a, one of the Queens that was just all nice and spread out warming up for the day. And I thought it was a good opportunity to grab a picture to show you how much it looks like a monarch. People get those confused very, very easily. Um, the picture on the right, I just happened to grab three, you know, three little queens playing on flowers together and um, captured this shot. It's not perfect because it's, it's not in perfect focus. Um, that's something else you'll learn about when you go down to this butterfly festival. It's very windy that, this time of year. Um, so you, as a photographer who's trying to capture something, it's really hard to get a lot of things in focus. Um, and plus you really can't carry a tripod around with you. You just don't have the time to do that. You got a free hand, everything. If, if 
If documenting is very important to you, just freehand it and do the best you can. What's really great about going as a group is that the person who is leading your group will say, has everybody seen this butterfly? And we all step in lightly, lean forward, get a picture of it, and then we're back out so other people can get in. So a lot of these pictures I only had like a hot minute and then I was back out. But what's really cool is in the middle, we were on someone's private land at their home. They were so nice to let us on their home. And I guess they've gone there for years for the festival. Someone said, here is a queen butterfly that just came out of its chrysalis. On the front side of that leaf, which I don't have pictured here is the chrysalis, but this queen still has pieces of chrysalis stuck on her, as you can see where she came out. And if you've raised butterflies yourself, you know what it's like when the chrysalis is stuck. So she's still gonna pump all of this blood here into those wings. She literally had just come out. She even has a piece stuck right up there on her antenna. Um, but this is what they look like when they first come out. And then they pump themselves up all big and beautiful and they turn into the first picture, this big one. So that's the queen and we saw lots of those. Have any of you guys seen queens before, anybody? Feel free to unmute if you want. I'm just curious, do they have the same like raised dot on the hind wing that shows like male, female as They do, food? they do have some dots. It's, it's a little more prominent on this particular one. And from what I learned, it was really hard to tell because some females have, have some dots too. Uh, there's a little more white on, on their hind wings, um, but they, they do have the same, the same spots. They're much smaller though, but they're not as small as a viceroy, which is our state butterfly, which has the line that goes through the back of it. And people often confuse those, but if you've, the viceroy has that white line that goes back through here. If you're looking at my laser pointer there, I hope you can see it. Um, and that's what's on uh, license plates here in Kentucky as well. Let me see. The next picture I wanna show you guys. Oh. I screwed up my, my ability to move. There we go. Okay, the next picture I wanna show you were just some of the smaller um, butterflies that were there. The first one up in the upper left is called a dainty sulfur. It was no bigger than a nickel. Um, the one to the right of that, the little orange one is called a Southern skipperling. It literally looked like the size of my pinky nail. <laughs> it was really long very long with a white kind of stripe in the middle. We don't get those up here, Southern Skipperling. And it is in the, um, it is in the Skipper family, but it's called a Skipperling because it's very, very small. And then the other very small one is called the Clyte, C-L-Y-T-I-E hair streak. And that is this white one down here in the bottom. Um, we were at a beautiful state park in Texas called Falcon, just like the bird, Falcon State Park. And we could have spent all day there, but we had so many other places to see, but it was very, very productive. This tiny little guy was inside a, ro a row of bushes and you guys are, are flower people and you might know what kind of bush this is and I apologize that I don't know. Um, but that butterfly is literally the size of, I don't know, maybe not even a full size of a dime. So it was, they like to hide, as you can see in this picture, they hide on the leaves or under them. And so I had to stand over top of, straddle the branch over top to get that shot and this shot and just hope that I was getting it in, in focus. That's the plight of a butterfly photographer. And that's how it all started with me was with photography and shooting flowers and then butterflies and insects just kept getting in my shot. So <laughs> here we are today. I started a butterfly chapter. Now, I heard somebody earlier was talking about the sulfurs that we have in our area. And we have um, the clouded sulfur and we have the cloudless sulfur and the cabbage whites. And those are kind of very common in our area. But what we do not have here is the large orange sulfur. And as like all butterflies that I almost I found the whole time, this one was hiding in a big row of trees and the only way I could get it, no one was around me. So I stepped in as close as I could, but I, there was no way I could avoid getting, not getting these leaves in my shot, but I still love it. It's a large orange sulfur and it has this 
dark line that runs here and a dark line that runs here and a dark line here, that the cloudless sulfur, the bigger yellow one that you guys see, bigger than the tiny ones, um, are floating around and they use senna as their, um, as their host plant. Um, that's where it looks like that one, but it's not. So in our area, if we had both of these, we'd be very confused. There is an orange barred sulfur in Texas, as sulfur as well in Texas, but we did not see any of those. Over here on the right is the, is the bordered patch. And I just remember everyone being excited when we saw it. <laughs> so that was one of the exciting butterflies. Let me be very clear. All of these butterflies were exciting to me because I don't, we don't have any of them in our area. But some of those people were like, oh my gosh, we have a bordered patch and everyone came running. So I was already excited and I know which ones of these they were very excited about. But this is, a, all these butterflies I'm showing you are mainly South Texas only. You're not gonna see them anywhere else. Some of them you will. This goes up further, but not as far as us. So that is the bordered patch. Remember, stop me at any time if you have any questions. I was just curious to use a flash. For um, I, I, I had did not use a flash. Sometimes I have an external flash I put on the camera, but I did not take it with me. Um, sometimes I shoot, I shoot manual like AV mode all the time. If it's really dark, I'll pop that flash up. But I found out that when I was doing it, it was or if they're tucked in the in the in the trees or the limbs there that it just blew them out too much. So I just didn't, I just had to get really sneaky. I mean, I really just got somewhere I could stick my lens inside a couple of leaves and hope that I got it. Well, as you know, always shoot, always focus on the eyes, always. The eyes are the most important. And when I blew this picture up of the large orange sulfur and saw that I had those eyes that crisp, I about cried <laughs> because I didn't have the back of the wings, Chris, but they're hiding behind leaves, but it's still a beautiful shot. So aren't we our worst critics? We really are. Okay, this one's fun. So this is just a sampling of four of the brown uh, skippers that are in the area in South Texas. Now you see why being a butterfly person is so hard. We have a lot of skippers here in, in Kentucky. I mean, it's it, there's a large amount. Um, for some reason this year, and I don't have it pictured here, we had an explosion of, some people say sachem or sachem skippers. Um, the Arboretum had an explosion of them. Flora Cliff said they had an explosion of them. And what I mean by explosion is there were thousands of them everywhere. It wasn't like that last year. I don't know if it'll be that way next year. Um, but we had a huge explosion of them. What we have pictured here, and I'm gonna use my pointer, this upper left picture is a double dotted skipper. And it made everybody very excited, especially my guide. He got very excited when we saw the double dotted skipper. So just know, just know that that one's important if you go down to the festival. And it's because it has extra, like two or three extra dots here. And if it had opened its wings, you would have seen some more on the inside. And I couldn't get them to open their wings. They don't, they don't sit with their wings open very often at all. This one in the top right, I was convinced it was an Ocola, O-C-O-L-A. The Ocola looks just like this. And it does come into Kentucky. And I did identify some of those this summer. And we had an explosion of those this year. And they're not, it's not normal for us. But today I posted this in our NABA Butterflies Facebook page. And I said, I just wanna make sure this isn't a cola. And one of the ladies who was a guide, her name was Linda, said that is not an Ocola, that is a purple washed skipper. It's in the same family, but it's different. And the only way you can tell that, I think is maybe by an antenna bulb, you know, up here. I think that's how she identified it, or maybe even this white fringe on the edge. So you see how difficult it was for me when I was there. And you really don't know what you have sometimes till you get home and you put them on your computer and then you see your pictures and then you share them with people who were also at the festival and say, I'm sorry, I can't remember what this is. And then those experts come out and help us. This one down here is a fawn spotted skipper and they don't sit still. 
they sit on a flower for two seconds and go to another flower. And as you can see, the mist flower is very, very popular in Southern Texas. Almost every butterfly we found was on the mist flower, in the mist flower family, except this guy's not, but um, this fawn spotted skipper likes to feed for two seconds and move. So you literally have to have a really, just be ready to go, your shutter speed fast and capture it as you can. But they were really cute. <laughs> they're, just, they're just the cutest ones. This guy's a little bigger and we're still researching it. I've actually stumped some of the people who were the guides. Uh, we think it's a clouded skipper, which we, we, do, we can get up here in Kentucky, but it has this white fringe on the edge and it even stumped our biggest expert. So she said, I'm still gonna think about that. You tell people in your presentation that I, I'm still looking at that. So for now, we think it's a clouded skipper. Oh, this is, this is the marine blue and we don't have these here. And you can see just how gorgeous it is. It's about the size of a nickel, maybe a little bigger. Um, and now my cat's decided he'd like to join the party. Um, and when its wings are open, look how beautiful the blue is. It's just gorgeous. And you don't know that blue's hiding in here because right here it just looks brown. Everything looks brown until it opens up. And I just got really fortunate that it opened its wings uh, to just get some sun to, to warm up. It, this one was taken in the morning, so it was still trying to still trying to warm up. And that's your best chance. If you love butterflies and you really wanna catch them when their wings are open and it's not a butterfly that normally does, try to go out um, after the sun has come up, if it's in the summer and it's still warm and there's dew on the grass, they like to drink the dew from the, from the leaves um, and also at sunset because then they're going to their flower or their leaf and they're gonna sit still and they're not gonna move and it's easier to get a picture of them that way. So those are little tips. This is the mallow scrub hair streak. And the one on the left, I at first I called it a Serranus blue. And then when I put it up next to a Serranus blue, I said, no, that's not it. It's the darker version of this mallow scrub hair streak. And they come in different versions based on male and female. And I haven't studied it enough, honestly, with you to figure out which one's male and female, but typically uh, the males are darker and sometimes in the hair streak family and the females are a little prettier. But this just gives you uh, an example of how tricky it is when you're IDing out on the field because you see this and then you see this and you're not sure you've got the same thing, but they are the same thing. And that's the mallow scrub hair streak. This is the Reichert's blue. It's in the blue family. Um, and it also didn't show off any blue till it opens its wings and showed you that. And that's as far as it would open. Um, and it, it also eats and moves very quickly. But we caught this one in the morning, so it was hanging out just a little more, just a little longer. Um, really cute little butterfly. And we saw several of these in the area. So these aren't rare for South Texas, but they are, um, abundant in some of the state parks there. This is also one I had to put into the NABA page today. Um, and I put this picture down here in the bottom right in there because I knew what this top left one was. I knew it was a sickle wing and I couldn't remember what this bottom one was. And I kept calling it a scalloped wing. And then Mariana said, no, that's a sickle. And I was like, oh my gosh, yes, the whole festival. I kept calling the sickle wing a scalloped wing. But here's the problem. This is the female, which is lighter, and this is the male. Um, and so I was just really confused, but we do not have these sickle wing skippers here in this area. And they're not abundant in South Texas, um, but they, you will find them hiding in shady areas. Um, that's what they like most. And they're most, mostly on leaves. They're not a lot on flowers, although this one is this one is getting a little bit of, of nectar from the flower, but they're mainly on the leaves and they were kind of tucked in the bushes. So how, how big is that butterfly? I, you know what, I'd say that one is, is well, let me see, you know, about that big, if that makes any sense, if you can see my hands, yeah, about that big. <laughs> <laughs> um, when it's really spread out like that, they tend to tuck their wings over, as you can see the male, he's kind of tucking over. Um, so it kind of tricks you a little bit on, on how big they are. I was really happy to find that female all laid out. 
Um, the next one, and so this is something I wanted to see when I was there, was a metal mark. We don't have metal marks here. So this one on the top left is a red bordered metal mark. And it's pretty obvious. The border going all the way around it is red. Um, we saw several of those. And so they're, they're pretty well known in that area. This one on the right, I didn't know what I had. I posted it in the, on the page and I also a part of the Rio Grande Valley Butterfly Facebook page that I joined when I got back. And I said, I don't know what this is. I'm looking in my books, <coughs> excuse me. And I think it's a, a brown banded skipper. And sure enough, it is. Excuse me, but they were, they were like, oh my gosh, that's a great find. You found a brown banded skipper. And there it is. So that was a lot of fun. This on the left, <coughs> sorry, I have a tickle, is the Texas powdered skipper. And the one on the right is a Texas, Texas Crescent that has been poorly beaten up, unfortunately. But two of Texas specialty, so I wanted you to see those. The one on the left is called a Southern Dog Face, but I, I bet you guys can tell me what it looks like. You know what it looks like from our area. It looks like a clouded sulfur. If you got real close to a clouded sulfur, you would think that was it. What's so unique about this is this little back wing, and this one isn't doing it very much, but it kind of angel wings. It kind of has a little curve and it angel wings, which makes it nice. Its face is also a little different. This is one of my favorites. It's called a lyside sulfur. It's green in some lights, especially green with everything green around it in Texas but it has this vein going through it in the middle. And that's how you know what it is compared to other sulfurs you might see in Texas. Um, pretty abundant. We saw quite a bit of lyside. So it's probably their version of our cabbage white. They have a lot of those. Um, here's some, oh yeah, this is the, um, the Fayon Crescent up here in the right. So the crescents are everywhere. But this particular crescent has this extra white border right here that ours do not. And this pattern down here um, is a little different. So who, someone of you had the, a pearl crescent as your, as your picture there. But you, if you put the two side by side, you can see what the difference is between them. They do have other crescents in the area. And so I'd say the Fayon was the most popular. Once you saw a couple of them at the festival, you could always see them. Oh yeah, that's a fan. They do have Pearl Crescent in Texas, but they just don't have as many as we do. Someone did find one and to them that was exciting. They're like, what, you saw a Pearl Crescent? I was like, oh, we have those. We have those everywhere in Kentucky. So that was fun. This is the white patched skipper, which is not abundant in Texas, um, which was an exciting find um, for late in the year, for November, I was told. But I could be completely wrong. We. Here's why I say that. You get so much information in three days and everyone's telling you all the different scientific names of these butterflies and what kind they are and where they're found and how often we see them that I apologize if I have any of them wrong. But I remember someone telling me that they hadn't seen a white patch skipper in a while. So we were excited to see that one. This is fun because here in Kentucky, we have what's called a Carolina Seder. And we also have a little wood satyr, which is smaller. If you looked at this butterfly here in Kentucky and they stay in the woods on the forest edge, they don't come out to flowers. They love trees, sap, things like that that are in the forest. And they'll sit on the sunny parts of the leaves you and they fly up, up, up. That's how you know what you're finding. You're gonna see wings that are gonna be going up, up like this. Texas has decided to separate it from the Carolina Seder, and they now call it the South Texas Seder. Um, and I believe there is a specific reason why to that, and I, we didn't get to get into it, but when I took a picture of this, I was off by myself on a trail, and I said, oh, this looks like a Carolina Seder. We have these in Kentucky, and our guy who was extremely knowledgeable, his name was Martin. He was He's from London, England, but he, he's lived in the area for 30 years or more and has been doing this all his life said, 
oh, they just recently separated that out into the South, South Texas Seder. So I'm going to have to look up some information on why, why that was done. I'm sure if any of my friends from the festival see this presentation later, they'll be telling, they'll be sending me messages and telling me why. Okay, this is the, this is the banded patch. Everyone was very excited about the banded patch. This is one of those butterflies that we had to stop what we were doing. Everyone come over here, get a picture of this banded patch, take it home with you so you can see it. I got one of it with, with its wings closed. I have a, another monitor here sitting next to me and I can see it bigger, so I'm just looking at it. And then I have one where it opened its wings just for a hot second. So I wanted to show you what it looks like, the difference between closed and open wings. It's about the size of just a little bigger than a pearl crescent. Yes, it, it varies because she said the males and the females can be a little smaller from each other, but it, it, it really looks like one, some, something in the crescent family. It's really beautiful, as you can see. It's a beautiful butterfly. And then I was looking for them everywhere I went after that. <laughs> this on the left is called a common mestra, M-E-S-T-R-A, common. A lot of butterflies have, the, have common in their name, and I don't know why, because none of them are very common. They're just beautiful. Um, it doesn't make them, you know, unordinary. This is the common mestra. Just didn't see a lot of those, um, but they stayed low on the flowers, but lower to the ground, which remind me kind of of cabbage whites. This was my, one of my favorite butterflies. That is the Western pygmy blue. And I could not get it everywhere I saw it to open its wings to show me how beautiful it is on the inside. But this butterfly is about as big as my thumb. It's thumbnail. It's really small and just adorable. Um, quite social. It will sit there and let you take a picture of it. It just won't open its beautiful wings. This is fun. So in South Texas, they have a lot of long-tailed skippers. And this is a white striped long tail missing her tail. Um, that's something else we really noticed a lot of while we were there, and I think that's because of your bird prints. Birds are very apt to eating their tails off, as well as um, prey mantis. So, you know, who knows why she lost her tail, but the white striped long tail um, skipper is a pretty popular uh, long tailed skipper there. Without its tail, it looks like our silver spotted skipper that we see. Um, it flies in much the same way, very up, up, up but this one is actually laying an egg. She has already laid the egg and I'm gonna put my spot over it where it is. And then I'll take my spot away. It's tucked inside there. That little spot in the arc of her tail is the egg. This little piece of flower fell off when she was done. And now I'll show you the egg. Don't ask me how I got this picture. It is by the luck of the gods, of the butterfly gods. The wind was blowing so heavy. I had to wait till it stopped for a hot second. No one was around. I just waited and prayed and hit the shutter. And there it is. Wow. Oh, at full disclosure, there were a couple of limbs sticking out like here and here. And I just Photoshopped them out for the presentation um, because I wanted the effect to be of this of this flower. I don't know what kind of flower that is. I'm gonna go back. Um, some of you may know, but it was, it was a bush type situation. But look at the beautiful detail of all the little pollen, I would assume, or maybe that's the way it, you know, it grows. You can see it growing out of the top of the leaf right here. I wanted to get more detail on this egg, but rest assured it is, um, it is patterned very similar to a monarch egg, but obviously much more round and flat. But that is the egg. And on, in a very weird way, it took her a good five minutes to curl up into this ball. She just very slowly did it. She curled up. She laid the egg in here. I don't know what she's doing up here. I hope she didn't lay another egg because if she did, it fell off. She moved her tail down. That flower fell. And that we were left with that. 
we're almost done. That's the Gulf fritillary, which we do have here. And that is the Durantis longtail. The brown long-tailed skipper, like I said, they have lots of long tails and fiery skippers, which we have here, but they are much different color in South Texas. That is a female. This is the blue metal mark. It was the hot butterfly of the day. Um, and so we all waited till it opened its wings to get a picture. We do not have those here. It is a good reason to go to Texas. Trust me, you're gonna wanna see this blue metal mark. The other big find of the festival and everyone is on the search for it at all times is the Mexican blue wing. And that's this. When it's closed up, it looks like the bark of the tree. That's why you have a hard time seeing it. It eats sap from trees. Um, you could put a bait log out, which the butterfly center does, and it'll come to the bait log. But when its wings are closed, you may not find it because it looks just like the log. And then if you're, if you're lucky enough, it opens its wings and that is shown. It is, it is the reason also to go, those were only found in South Texas unless you go over to Mexico. They fly up from Mexico. This is the white peacock, which is just gorgeous. I just love it. Here's some other fun stuff and then we're done. There's a tree in the back of the center that we figured out has these beautiful caterpillars. It is a silk moth caterpillar and I just learned uh, what the name of it was from someone in our group and I apologize, I will send that to you later, but this is its cocoon and here it's getting ready to start making its cocoon. Um, it starts with an L, um, Leanthus or something, um, but I'll, I'll figure it out for you and I'll send it to you. But anyway, that's the caterpillar. We, we watch those under black lights, but you can do it at your house. Go outside with black light at night and start shining them in your bushes and trees and see caterpillars you never even knew were there. Here's your birds. This is the chachalaca. The chachalaca. It is a ground bird. It doesn't fly very much. And they have them at the butterfly center in the back where they feed them with just oranges on trees and they come to the oranges. Um, and they're just the funniest looking weird birds and they make weird noises. Uh, this was an egret that was on the Rio Grande River that I took from a boat. I did not have a long lens, but um, Mariana's husband got us close with his boat. And then I cropped this picture to show it to you. I was underneath of the curved bill thrasher. I had no idea it was a curved bill thrasher till yesterday. <laughs> I looked it up and I was like, oh, that's really cool. This is a green jay. We don't have green jays here. We have blue jays. Uh, their mannerisms are very much the same, but they do not sound like a blue jay when they make a noise. And they're, they're quite big and they hung out with the chachalacas. They're like, buddies. Um, on the boat, I also got to see the green kingfisher, and this is a really bad picture, but I, he got me as close as I could, and then I cropped it in, but we do not have these birds here. This is the Harris's hawk. I was standing underneath of this hawk, um, and this is cropped in a little bit. Our last slide is just some fun stuff. This is the tree that was next to the Mexican blue wing. This cool mantis was on it and he was doing a little dance. I actually have a video, but I didn't add it to this presentation. Um, and he was really cool just hanging out there. And we saw several of this species of, of mantis there. This is the white tipped black moth. And if you know anything about moths, male moths have feathered antenna and females do not, they're just straight. Moths don't have clubs or bulbs at the end and butterflies do. And butterflies never have feathered antenna, but everyone was very excited about this moth. People come running. So I guess it only comes at certain times. I think it comes there every year, but only at certain times. So everybody was very excited. And last but not least, this really cool bug <laughs> called a wild olive tortoise beetle. And this is the larva for that, for that beetle. And you see what it does. I left this leaf in here so you guys could see what it does to that particular tree. But this was in a, in a nature preserve area at a, historic, at a historic place, so they let it go. They let nature take its course, they let it eat the leaves, and then it turns into its beautiful beetle later, which actually looks like a golden ladybug without spots. That's kind of what that looks like. That'll be great. That looks like a marvelous organization. Thank you for uh, sharing with us about that. You're welcome. We have 
partners in this endeavor to you know, absolutely keep nature working for us um, um anybody i saw a whole lot of butterflies i've never seen before so that that was exciting so that's that was me i, I did a, if you get a chance i'm gonna put, i'm gonna put the link to my facebook page in the chat mm -hmm. um, for navis central kentucky and i put a video on there when i got there um that first day was community day and I just felt overwhelmed and felt like I needed to capture the moment. Um, I wish I would have had time to do that every day, but trust me when you're there at eight o'clock in the morning and you don't get done till five and then they have beautiful reception. She had amazing people come and make amazing Mexican food for us while we were there each night. It was day of the dead, uh, the last reception night. So we had a day of the dead. Uh, kind of festival um, just for ourselves and tons of food. You're so tired. I couldn't barely even get all my photos off the camera. <laughs> when I got back to the ho hotel. I was like, I just want to go to sleep. Um, Cause you will get at least, you know, 20,000 steps in for a day, but let me put in our, our Facebook page. And then you can go watch the video from, from there. Actually, I, shared that video oh good might have been just this morning or maybe yesterday to our group page i have okay, good see it. Um, good yeah that thank was you well you just become overwhelmed especially if you love butterflies and nature as much as me and i'm sure um you guys are just as as you know passionate about the things that you do in, in your lives with, with flowers or with uh, any of your hobbies that you do, whatever it is. And then you go to the Mecca of that place <laughs> and you're like, oh my God, I'm here. I can't believe it. Um, yeah. So it is, it is a pretty big deal. Um, I am trying to find the, here it is. Here's the membership link. So do they, um plant a lot of the host plants there to attract yes, the butterflies they do yes um and I, I was as most may want to know queen butterflies also use milkweed the same way the monarch does which i wasn't sure just because it looked like a monarch didn't mean it had to use milkweed um, because the viceroy doesn't and it mimics they all mimic each other but yeah, so they do. They plant. They have. They have organizations come in and, and help them plant uh, the host plants and the trees um, for for all the all the things they have there. I mean, um, you're not just going to see butterflies and birds. You're going to see some wildlife as well, which is pretty amazing. Um, so yes, they they take care of, of all of that there and, and providing for all of those those areas there, which is which is pretty amazing. Um, Mariana likes to say everything in Texas fights for its life. And that is true. Um, she was bitten a week before we got there by leaf cutter ants that crawled up her pant leg. Um, she didn't have her pants tucked into her socks while we were there. And she thought she stepped on a fire ant nest because fire ants are everywhere in South Texas. And um, at the time, Border Patrol was over top of them, which Border Patrol's got a beef with her, and that's a story for another time. Um, and she had to take all her clothes off in the middle of the field because uh, she was getting she was getting bitten, and they're over top of her with the. She said she just took everything off. She said I dropped my pants, I dropped those pants, I dropped my shirt. Um, so just know when you go to the area uh, to wear. Uh, long pants and you can buy them with bug spray already in them that's what i did it's called royal robins um i bought a shirt socks and pants that all had bug spray in them and then i sprayed underneath that and tucked my socks my pants and my socks the first day it hurt my leg too much to do it the second and third day so i, I didn't get to do it but i had boots that i'd gotten at like j and h outdoor store here in lexington and um and it's hot and it's humid. The first day though was beautiful, sunny, no humidity. Second, third, fourth day, hot, 85, humid. But I bought a cooler while I was there at Target and I had carpool people with me and we put we just kept all our food. They provided lunch for us 
and I kept water and all of that. So um, I just donated my cooler when I left to the center because I didn't want to have to put it in the air, airplane on the way home. So I was like, here, just keep this. You guys use it for something. They have amazing staff. So I just gave it to them. I want you to know where you can go and, and put in your uh, sightings. And that's the part I'm trying to find on the, on the website, which is kind of crazy that I can't find it. But um, here it is, butterfly mon monitoring, recent sightings. So that's the sightings page where you go and you put, you log in, just set it up and you can, you say you're out in your front yard and you'll say, oh, look, I found a, a cabbage white. If you're not sure what it is, sign up for iNaturalist. Put it in iNaturalist. Make sure you get a really good, clear photo. Take several photos. I think it'll take four. Let someone guess for you. Once you know what it is, then go into NABA sightings. Click on new sighting when you get on that page. There's only one NABA count circle active in Kentucky. And that is the one that Beverly set up that was on my slide in central Kentucky. So if you want to set up um, a count, when you go to the butterfly monitoring page, and this is the monitoring page, I'll put it in the chat. That's the monitoring page. When you go there, butterfly counts is one of the links and it'll say how to participate, how to start a new count, pre-register a new count, place a new count circle, and then all your forms that you need are all down there. Um, it's a pretty big undertaking. Beverly's got it down to an exact science and she's amazing and I'm very thankful for her that she, that she does this. Um, and then she ends up submitting all the data to NABA herself. Um, and then usually sends it all out to us just to let us know what all was found. Um, so only one count circle now, but that doesn't mean we can't create more count circles in your area and get, you know, several, several uh, cities around where you are. So that just gives you all the information there. I just ask if any other count circles are set up in Kentucky that you tell me so that I can make sure I'm talking to NAB and let them know what's going on. Um, but that's a good place for you to start. The butterfly gardening page is where, here's the one where all the signs are. So let me put this one in and a whole bunch of other really fun stuff. So you've already got your garden set up. You go to nababutterfly.com. And once you click on that website, you'll see the butterfly garden and habitat program. And there's all kinds of tabs at the top. You can spend the rest of your evening just flipping through those tabs. Um, so I think that was really the most important links that I wanted you to see. Um, if there's more, I can always send them to you uh, later. I'm going to pop my presentation over on this TV and just make sure I didn't miss, I didn't miss another link. I don't uh, see. I was oh. curious, you said Columbia Gas was one mm -hmm. of your yes. corporate members. They are. And the reason that is because they have a lot of right-of-way areas. And so they're trying to keep pollinator gardens on some right-of-way spots. Uh, but they also, I just recently, uh, Susan Lyon Murray has been a member of my chapter for so long and she's with Columbia Gas. Uh, and I knew they had a spot on Leestown Road in Lexington, but if you come to Masterson Station Park in Lexington, I just, I just found it this year on Leestown Road, uh, not the main entrance, it's the second entrance. There is a big, beautiful garden that is sponsored by Columbia Gas and Parks and Rec here in Lexington. And it is a big, beautiful garden. And I found so, and it's, it's like half a mile long. Um, I spent a lot of time there. I foresee myself spending a lot of time there again next year because I found it late in the season. And that's where my, my tip came in for sunset. I was there at sunset and then all these butterflies just started going to sleep and they were just sitting there. I was like, oh my God. And now it was golden hour. So I was just catching them all in this beautiful golden, golden hour. So yes, organizations like that can, especially if they have a lot of acreage and land uh, with the factory or something. We have uh, Country Boy Brewing in Georgetown, Kentucky, uh, put some away stations up. They did that with the state pollinator program. The state of Kentucky does have a monarch conservation program. And I sit on, on the board, it's called the Pollinator Stakeholders Group. And so they go around, we're trying to get West Six Farm to do it as well in Frankfurt. Um, and I think they're on board. I think they've already discussed with them. 
and other places like that, which you wouldn't think you'd see, but you want to get the word out. We need to get gardens planted and get uh, monarch conservation and just butterfly conservation in general. So when I started NABA, I had the mayor of Lexington sign the mayor's monarch pledge with the National Wildlife Foundation or Federation, Foundation, Federation. Um, and you can ha have your mayor sign it as well. And then Parks and Rec here in Lexington administers it. There's 25 things you have to do to be a mayor's monarch pledge city. It has to be done every year. When you get a new mayor, that new mayor has to sign a pledge to say they'll do it again, which we got our new mayor, Linda Gordon did it and she signed the pledge. Uh, but she's a big gardener, thank goodness. And um, then Parks and Rec, plus we had all this stuff planned to go with the pledge and then COVID hit. We had a big festival planned. Uh, we're planning a spring festival at Perryville Battlefield. So if you're near Perryville, there will be one in the spring. We're gonna do it in May. I think it's the first week of, first or second week of May. I'm still waiting on them to tell me when that will be. It's called Spring Fest. So that might be a good opportunity for you to have a, have a table there for your organization. And once I find out more information, I'll, I'll let you guys know. That's still in the process of being worked out. So things like that. I mean, I think we work very closely with other wild, the Wild Ones chapter here in Lexington as well. Linda Porter has been huge help teaching me all kinds of things um, about flowers and plants that I didn't know anything until I started learning about butterflies. So it's been really great. <laughs> That'd be awesome. How, how big can a circle be? When you say circle, how, I'm going to go here and I'm going to go here and look right now and see if it says um, about placing a new count circle. Here, I'm going to share my screen if that's okay. Real quick, and that way we can read it together. You see it? Um, so we can can we can see the text a little easier? You want me to make it bigger? Uh, yeah, if you zoom in on a little bit. Uh -huh. that might help us. Thank you. You're welcome. Very nice. Oh, well, that's probably too big. <laughs> um, okay, learn, drag red markers that are being considered. It really doesn't, it really doesn't say how big it can be. I, I think, I think that it depends the, on the how size many, is set. Huh? Um, I think that it's 15 kilometers, no okay. matter what. I think that's okay. set so that it's more comparable, uh, you know, each count to each other count. Right. I can't remember um, if it's a 15 Beverly kilometer set it up, I, Yeah, since Beverly set it up, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Um, but anyway, there's the website up there. I put it in the chat as well. So I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what that circle count is. But I, I mean, I'm from Nicholsville originally and I'd love to have a count in Nicholsville as well. I'd love to have a count in each county that is in our right around Lexington. Um, get someone to do a count in each one. That's my big dream, but you know, we're just getting started. So uh, we, have to, we have to spread the word. And that's what I want you guys to do as well. Even if you're not a member of our chapter and joining is not a thing for you, you can still come to our field trips and we'll still have outings for that. Um, there may be a small charge for like five bucks, uh, but that just goes towards our chapter and that just pays me back if I get snacks for people <laughs> on outings, buy some bottle of water for people and, and some fruit or something just to keep everybody hydrated when we go out. So yeah, we do hope, I usually will start outings probably in March because I like to see the early stuff, if we don't have a lot of snow, um, still coming out early because this is the biggest time of year that people tell you do not rake up your leaves. And I'm probably preaching to the choir with this group, but a lot of butterflies overwinter as adults in the leaves. Um, and a lot of them overwinter as a chrysalis in the weeds, I mean, in the leaves, sorry. So, or, or what people think are weeds. So they tell you, don't, don't clean up your yard. Don't, Get your leaf blower out and start blowing things around because you're blowing the butterflies around and the moths. Moths are just as important. All of our pollinators are just as important. So we want to do what we can to keep them around. So I usually I usually start going out about March and just kind of look. I probably have an official outing starting in April when I've scouted everything. That sounds like a, a really good 
cooperative outing we could do. Our outings have been mostly just looking at plants, but if we had a specific goal in mind, that might be a... Well, we could do it together. You could teach me yeah. about plants and okay. I can teach you, you about butterflies. And um, maybe we can find a spot and pick, set up Absolutely. a circle. So Gary, Gary did put in the chat that the Williams oh, yeah. group place is active. Um, so it's nice to know there's more of us out there than we realize. That's good. Just, yeah, yeah hook yeah. me up with those people, Gary. I'd love to come help and be in that area, go to Williamsburg and see what's hanging out there. That'd be a lot of fun. Many great spots. The other place that might be a good spot is Mammoth Cave because they have some unique habitats. Absolutely. And I've never and lived in uh, Kentucky my entire life and have never no. been to Mammoth Cave. Yeah, the Perryville Battlefield. I don't know if we could do that as an outing. How far away yeah. is that from you? It is. It's a good two hours. Okay. Two, two, two to two and a half hours. But okay. It takes yeah, me about can, an hour to get there, depending on traffic. But um, it's a good yeah, drive for me. So. It's a really beautiful park, though. It is. It's a beautiful park, and they have the they have um, a butterfly a monarch way station at their visitor center, and then if you come out of the main gate and hang a right, the first stop to the left is a great place to walk through some woods. But the Dye House, D Y E, the Dye House is where they tagged the monarch butterfly last year. That was located in Mexico this spring. Wow. You see, it was on the news and it's it's been talked about. It was Michaela Rogers, our state's monarch conservation. She works mm -hmm. for Fish and Wildlife. She mm -hmm. took a group out there. I had to work that day, so I didn't get to go. But she took a group out there this time and they tagged. There was like 30 people there this time and tagged. But this was last year, last year's event. They tagged at the Dye House. They did a very small group because of COVID, only like six people. Um, and one of those monarchs was discovered in Mexico at one of the biggest sanctuaries, Sierra Palom. So it works. Tagging yeah. works. Okay. Um, you had sent out an email for the NABA um, webinar they had a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And that was all about native plants. I know it was um, somewhere yes. in the in the east, but is there any way we would be able to watch that again? I think so. That reminds me. I just got an email today that we're doing another NAB. They're calling them NABA chats and they just started them. Yeah. Call me anytime you want to talk about butterflies. Just send me a message on on our NABA Facebook page and, and we'll talk about it. And Gary, you tell me where that count is and I'd love to know more about it. All right. And again, uh, she, uh, Karen shared information about how you can join NABA if you want to get more involved with that group. And of course, you're always welcome to join Wild Ones. And um, you can join through our national website and just pick our chapter to be affiliated or whatever chapter is closest to you. And I encourage everybody to get involved how you can and help out where you can. So thanks again, everybody, for coming to hear about butterflies tonight. Thanks, oh, everybody. Right. I really appreciate Thank you, everybody. It. That was marvelous, Karen. Thank you so much. Thank really you. Enjoyed it. Okay.